We start from Brazil, where at least 42 prisoners have been strangled to death in four jails in Brazil's Amazon city. Police said a fight between rival prison gangs escalated into a bloodbath. Reinforcements were sent as the riot spread to other jails as well. Federal task forces eventually managed to contain the situation. The family members of the victims launched a protest, blocking roads and burning fences. Authorities managed to restore order after negotiating with the demonstrating relatives. Brazil's president, Jair Bolsonaro, has pledged to build more jails to reduce overcrowding and prevent riots. Israel's parliament has passed a preliminary motion to dissolve itself. If the bill receives final passage in a vote on May the 29th, the country would be forced to hold new elections. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is struggling to form a coalition before the final vote tomorrow. In a televised speech, Netanyahu blamed former Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman for creating the crisis. Avigdor Lieberman has insisted on passing a new law mandating that young ultra-Orthodox men be drafted into the military. Netanyahu's ultra-Orthodox allies have demanded the draft exemptions remain in place. Without Lieberman's Israel, Bataino party's five seats, Netanyahu does not have the number to form a government. Turkey has launched a counterterrorism operation against militants in northern Iraq. The Turkish military said its artillery has been shelling targets in northern Iraq to neutralize PKK fighters and destroy their weapons. The ministry said the operation is going as planned. Russia has called for complete withdrawal of all the international forces from Afghanistan, meeting Afghan government and the Taliban delegations. Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said there is no military solution to the conflict. A delegation headed by Taliban Deputy Leader Mullah Abdul Ghani Barada and Afghan politicians are in Moscow for two days of talks. The Taliban also insisted foreign forces must leave Afghanistan for a peace agreement. But others said Taliban want peace, but the first step is to remove obstacles and end the country's occupation. The High Peace Council's head, Karim Khalili, said it is time for a dignified mechanism to end the bloodshed. Former President Hamid Karzai and Afghan ambassador to Russia, Mohammad Latif Behant, also attended the event. At least one Syrian soldier has been killed in an Israeli rocket attack on a military position near the Golan Heights. Israel's military says the attack was a response to Syrian anti-aircraft fire at an Israeli fighter jet. Israel's military alleged the warplane was not hit, but that the Syrian projectile landed in Israeli territory. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Israel would not tolerate any aggression and will respond forcefully. Earlier this month, a Syrian media reported two incidents in which Israeli air attacks from the Golan struck inside southern Syria. At least two people, including a schoolgirl, have been killed, with 16 others wounded in a mass stabbing rampage in Japan. A 57-year-old man attacked a group of people with a knife in the town of Kawasaki, just south of Tokyo. The suspect was reported dead from a self-inflicted injury. Thirteen of the victims were primary schoolgirls aged six or seven. The attack occurred during the busy early morning commute as workers headed toward their offices and children to school. Although Japan has one of the lowest crime rates in the world, it has had a series of high-profile killings. This is the fourth mass stabbing in the country since 2001. Sudan's alliance of opposition and protest groups have started a two-day general strike in the country. The move came amid escalated tensions after the talks over the ruling military council collapsed again. The opposition alliance has criticized the military for demanding a two-thirds majority in the new council. Vagdeh Saleh, opposition spokesperson, threatened to launch a civil disobedience movement if their demands are not met. 
Meanwhile, the military says the opposition wants to confine it to a ceremonial role in the council. Poland has decided to buy 32 Lockheed Martin F-35A fighter jets to replace its aging Soviet-era warplanes. The quotation for the aircraft along with the logistics and training package has been sent to America. Polish Defense Minister Maurice Blazak announced the deal amid Russia's growing assertiveness. He claimed progress in convincing the United States to increase its military presence on Polish soil. Poland is among NATO member countries that spend at least 2% of its GDP on defense. The F-35A fighters are estimated to cost $85 million each. In the wake of the European elections, the contest for the European Union Parliament's top job has kicked off. Paris and Berlin appear on a collision course with the replacement of Jean-Claude Juncker as Commission President. The German Chancellor Angela Merkel is backing the German MEP Manfred Weber. Merkel said Germany still favours picking the Spitzen candidate from a winning party. Under this system, the leader of the party that commands the largest coalition automatically takes the job. Merkel urged European Union leaders to agree fast on a nominee for the presidency. But French President Emmanuel Macron opposes the automatic candidate process. His meeting with the Spanish Prime Minister is being seen as a step toward forming a progressive alliance. The feud could hamper Weber's chances of winning the Council's top spot. Following Theresa May's resignation, the Tory leadership contest is picking up pace. Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt has warned against a no-deal Brexit. Meanwhile, Environment Minister Michael Gove has offered free passports to European Union nationals after Brexit. Gove pledged to waive a planned citizenship fee for eligible European nationals as a goodwill gesture. A £1,330 fee would be abandoned for around 3 million EU citizens who lived in UK at the time of the referendum. Leadership candidate Jeremy Hunt has called a no-deal Brexit political suicide. He pledged to negotiate a new agreement with the EU if he wins the leadership contest. Meanwhile, International Development Secretary Rory Stewart has promised a listening exercise on Brexit. This comes shortly after Housing Minister Kit Malthouse entered the race to replace Theresa May. Far-right Flemish separatists have made huge gains in Belgium's European Union elections. Meanwhile, voters in French-speaking Wallonia overwhelmingly voted for leftists. Here are the details. Belgian newspapers pushed opposing narratives the morning after the European Union elections. The French language Elisor stamped an optimistic two Belgiums on its front page. At the same time, the Dutch language paper De Morgan ran with the Flanders radicalizes. I expected this result, especially after all that happened last year when there were many fights inside the government. Flanders stands up for Flanders. In Flanders, the far right Vlaams Belong got over 18% of the vote. The Belgian nationalist NVA remains the biggest party in Flanders with about 25% of the vote. In Wallonia, the socialist PS remains the strongest party with 26% of the votes. I think it's going to be very difficult because there, there are a lot of people um, having different opinions, especially in the southern part of Belgium. So I think you see that actually it is two countries under one flag and I think they should make it like this, uh, make it a confederal uh, uh, country where you have the northern part who has their own opinion and the southern part and just keep it in, in, in one country but give everybody his opinion. Though the Flemish separatists are still a minority, their political significance has grown. Polls show most Belgians don't want their country split up. But the Flemish secessionists could embolden separatists in other parts of Europe, such as Catalonia. The election results also show that the far right continues to gain influence. 
Iran says it sees no prospect of negotiations with the United States amid recent tensions. Iranian Foreign Ministry's statement came a day after U.S. President Donald Trump hinted at a nuclear deal with Tehran. At a news conference in Tehran, Foreign Ministry spokesman Abbas Musavi said Iran pays no attention to mere lip service. Earlier, Iran's Foreign Minister Javad Zarif tweeted on the U.S. President's statement. Zarif said President Trump should make his intentions on talks clear through actions, not words. He blamed Trump's fresh round of sanctions on Iran for the rising regional strain. Tensions between the two countries has escalated after Washington sent military reinforcements to the Gulf region. A U.S. climber has died after descending from the summit of Mount Everest. The latest death has taken the season's toll to 11. The climber had already climbed the world's tallest peak and was safely back at the camp below the summit. His expedition organizers say the mountaineer had a sudden heart problem and passed away. A traffic jam of the climbers in the Everest death zone has been blamed for the fatalities. Nepal has issued a record 381 permits, costing $11,000 each. The recent fatalities have raised concerns that human life is less important than money. In Thailand, a pro-military party Pulang Pirachirat has invited the Bhumjai Thai party to form a new government as a coalition partner. Leaders of both the parties discussed a deal to keep the military junta chief General Periyut Chanocha as Prime Minister. The Bhumjai Thai party said it has accepted the invitation and its executive committee would deliberate on policies. The two parties say it would give the pro-army coalition a slim majority in the House of Representatives. In the March 24 election, no party won a majority in the 500-seat lower house. In Bangladesh, fishermen are protesting against a 65-day embargo on fishing in the Bay of Bengal. Protesters say the ban has affected the livelihoods of hundreds in the country's coastal villages. Here are the details. Bangladesh imposed a 65-day fishing ban in the Bay of Bengal last week. The embargo was imposed to replenish depleting stocks of fish. Coastal villagers who have relied on fishing to make a living for generations have rejected the ban. We cannot fish in the sea for 65 days. This is wrong. This is injustice. You want to ask the government why? The Bangladeshi Navy and Coast Guard are patrolling Bengali waters to prevent fishing activities. But local fishermen have alleged that foreign fishing vessels are still able to access the bay. The government had announced free rice rations for local fishermen. But protesters say they have not received the help. The government declared the affected will receive free rice. I don't know whether they have yet received any rice or government aid. The ban has also affected Rohingya refugees who have found work on fishing trawlers. Fishermen have threatened to march on Dhaka if the ban is not shortened. Falling coffee prices on New York Stock Exchange have upset coffee growers in Colombia. In the middle of a financial crisis, some coffee growers have been forced to rip up their crops to grow anything but coffee. This report has more. High in the lush green mountains of western Colombia, the world's finest high-end Arabica coffee is cultivated. Colombia is one of the largest coffee producers globally. Enjoying a cup of Colombian coffee means indulging in a brightly acidic with mild fruity and chocolatey flavors. The international reference price for coffee has dropped to less than a dollar per pound, the lowest in history. Growers are up in arms over the prices being fixed in isolation on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Producers say they are selling at a loss, blaming the crash, devastating their industry on the stock market. This problem that we currently have in Colombia is a problem in all coffee producing countries of the world. The price of the different coffees produced by the countries is at supremely low levels that do not cover production costs. Gustavo Echeverri, a coffee producer, expressed the frustration of thousands of coffee growers nestled in the mountains. He said hopeless coffee producers are being forced to quit this generation old profession.
We are no longer in our comfort zone, so we have to reinvent ourselves and do new things and new activities to succeed. One of them is tourism. Fearing the social impact of falling prices, the government has announced financial aid to coffee growers. The country's Coffee Federation is seeking to extricate producers from the New York Stock Exchange, which has set prices for decades. But such a radical change will take time. Meanwhile, up in the mountains, people are selling their farms before the next harvest comes in October. Malaysia has decided to send back around 3,000 tons of plastic waste sent for recycling from Europe and the United States. Here are the details. China's ban on accepting the world's used plastic has plunged the global recycling industry into turmoil. The world's recyclable plastic is now being shipped to other Asian countries to be illegally dumped, buried or burned. Milk. Malaysia. Malaysia is the latest Asian country to reject rich countries' rubbish. Some 14 countries, including the U.S., Canada, Australia and Britain, sent their unwanted uh, waste under the pretext uh, of recycling. What the citizen of the U.K. believe that they send for recycling is actually dumped in our country. And this is something that is very serious. And we do not only found this one company, we have found a few companies from different countries. Dozens of recycling factories have cropped up in Malaysia, many without operating licenses. Communities have complained of worsening environmental problems due to the recycling industry. Malaysians, like any other developing countries, have a right to clean air, clean water, sustainable resources and clean environment to live in just like citizens of developed nation. Officials said 60 containers of illegally imported trash would be sent back. We are compiling the list of the so-called recycling companies from this developed country and we will send back, send the list of these uh, names of these companies to the respective governments to take uh, to take further actions against. Only an estimated 9% of plastic produced worldwide is recycled. Environmental activists say that the only long-term solution is to limit both plastic production and consumption. Here is an interesting news. A 72-year-old French man has crossed the Atlantic Ocean in a barrel. After 127 days at sea, the adventurous septuagenarian is already planning his next escapade. Here are the details. 72-year-old Jean-Jacques Savin travelled 5,800 kilometres at sea in a custom-made barrel. The vessel measured 3 metres in length and has 6 square metres of living space. Savin lost 4 kilos along the way and mainly survived on a diet of freeze-dried food. It was a great experience. It was four months of freedom. All my life I have always looked for a side of freedom. For four months I flirted with Elu. I was with her the whole way. When things were going well, she sent me south. When things were going a little badly between us, when she got upset, she sent me towards the north. On most days, the French adventurer kept himself busy by answering emails and writing his book. His closest calls during the trip were almost being hit by a cargo ship and one particularly stormy night. Luckily, I had this smoke flare ready because at the last moment he sounded a siren to warn me that he had seen me. Wow! And then I saw his bow swinging and it passed me by about 15 meters under my moustache. It was a moment, yes, very difficult. You can feel your legs shaking. The daredevil says he feels completely healthy, but doctors have advised him to get a full checkup. Now he has set his sights on swimming the English Channel. Lows in the highs of the business world now, Alibaba is considering raising up to $20 billion through listing a Hong Kong. This would be the company's second blockbuster deal following its 2014 record $25 billion float in New York. The deal would give Alibaba a war chest to keep investing in technology to see out the US-China trade dispute. The e-commerce giant is working to file an application confidentially in Hong Kong in the second half of 2019. 
The expected deal would be the biggest follow-on share sale in seven years globally. European equities have slid as investors tracked a brewing political fight between Brussels and Rome. Milan's stock market was the worst performer, sinking by just over 1% as Italian debt concerns grew. However, losses were capped elsewhere after a fierce surge in populist groups largely failed to materialize in the European elections. London stocks dipped 0.2%, while Frankfurt shed half a percent and Paris was down 0.6%. According to reports, the EU has warned Rome it could be fined for failing to curb its debt levels. Italy's joint deputy prime minister, Matteo Salvini, has declared he will use all his energies to fight the EU rules. Young players across Afghanistan are pursuing their passion of becoming professional cricketers. Most of them are following the national team's players who are in England for the World Cup. With the Cricket World Cup just around the corner, the excitement is growing amongst the youngsters of Afghanistan. The roots of cricket in Afghan skulks back to the time when thousands of people migrated to Pakistan after the Soviet invasion. A young player shared his dream to become a successful cricketer. He aims to be a source of pride for his family and country. It's one of my dreams to become a cricket player and to be honored by people. I want my countrymen, my family and my relatives to watch me on TV. I want to become a champion and bring cubs to Afghanistan. It's my dream to play in the Cricket World Cup. Afghanistan's national cricket team player Hamid Hassan said that the youngsters can flourish with the available resources. The way boys playing, uh, you can see there are many players are coming and they are inspiring from the national players. So this is the best way uh, and best platform for the boys, especially the youngsters who want to play for Afghanistan. In a war hit country, Afghans enjoy during the non-fighting season by playing cricket in different areas. The Taliban banned games, including cricket and soccer, but they later became more tolerant towards sports. Time to take a look at the weather situation around the globe. And that's all for now. Stay tuned for further updates on Indus News. Thank you for watching.